Good morning. How's everybody today? Enjoying this beautiful bazaar, beautiful educational. My God, it's gorgeous in Maine. I've never been this far up. I've never been to Bar Harbor. My name is Chef Sherry Pocknett. I am from Mashpee, Massachusetts. I am a Wampanoag uh, indigenous person. I, both on both sides of my parents and um, we're from Mashpee, Massachusetts, Cape Cod. And i uh, been cooking since I was about eight. I'm not kidding. I had a, uh, not an easy bake oven, a Susie homemaker. <laughs> yeah, I was born in the 60s. And I would cook anything in that Susie homemaker, including deer meat, eels, whatever it was that was in that easy make, easy, um, <laughs> Susie homemaker that my, that my mom had in the refrigerator that my dad brought from the wild. Um, fed it to my brothers, they loved it. I knew I was a chef then. It's a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, hello everyone, I'm Chef Joe Robbins. I'm a Penobscot chef, and I grew up kind of in this area, more Old Town, Bangor area. Um, yeah, just excited to be here. Hi everyone, my name is Lisa Sockabason. I am co-CEO of Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, an indigenous nonprofit here, well, in Wabanaki territory, or what we also call the state of Maine. It's an organization of about 230-ish people, 70% indigenous, lots of food programs and commitment to our earth so that we can have those food programs. I am not a chef. I lead an organization, but I have a 10-year-old son who is a budding chef and will be going to a food camp this coming week. So that's pretty exciting. So we're going to get started. Are you guys excited to be here? Yeah. Yes. So I've been excited to come to be able to facilitate a panel with both Joe and Sherry. Um, we've been in deep conversation together from the moment that we met, which was on a Zoom call. We got deep really quickly. And we spent an hour together and it felt like 10 minutes. So we're gonna do our best to fill this space with as much richness as we did on our very first conversation. So I'm gonna launch into the first question. We know the traditional foods, let me start again. We know the traditional foods of this land nourished our bodies and the land it was grown on. We also know that indigenous foods, restaurants, and chefs are limited in numbers. Can you talk about the importance of visibility, not only for ourselves, but also for the health of our mother, Mother Earth? Hi. So I'm from a tribe and a time in life in the 60s, when I grew up in the 60s, we learned how to forge. I mean, unfortunately, nowadays, parents are making, working two and three jobs just to uh, make ends meet and don't have time for a lot of this. So I feel like if we educate people and um, make things so that we need, we, we just need to um, educate people on, let me start over. I'm at the end of, I gotta tell you what's going on so I can, so I can um, get comfortable again. I'm at the end of a um, battle of breast cancer that I have beaten. Yes, thank you. So sometimes the chemotherapy is coming out, so sometimes I get a little confused. Just tell me again, once again. Yeah, Sherry, talk, we've talked a lot about visibility. We talked about it yeah. before, we talked about it on the stage before our visitors came in here. The importance of having indigenous chefs, restaurants, our foods yeah. present for us, but for all people. Can you talk about that importance? Yes. Well, since... I'm a James Beard Award winner. Thank you. Um, 2023, when I was in the middle of the battle of cancer, my daughter had to walk me up physically. But since then, 
indigenous people have been coming out and getting restaurants and running restaurants. And it's really an amazing thing to educate people about us. We've been here for 14,000 years over some, some of us, and we're not going anywhere. So to educate people about us, for me, having a restaurant spread, because I'm on the East Coast, there's no other in, in, in my territory. And to come to Maine and, and, and see Joe, and meet Joe, it, it's, in order to keep this going, we have to just keep educating people. Yeah? I agree. Um, <clears throat> I'd say, uh, well, how many parents do we have in the room today? A lot. Um, I'd say one of the big things that you all can do is, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're the guidance of, of your children. So you think about like when you're trying to push your children to do something, uh, you know, what direction are you pushing them? How is that going to push the visibility of native food? Um, growing up, I certainly didn't, didn't think I would be sitting here. Uh, doing those kinds of things that, you know, traditional, going hunting, going fishing, doing all those, those things that have now inevitably led me to here. Uh, those things at the time didn't seem important, but now as I sit here and see those through lines that we draw, um, yeah, I think as you parent, like, you know, if you're growing up in an Indian tribe, it's, uh, you know, become a, a doctor, a lawyer, an Indian chief, like those are the things that we're all pushed to, but in the big picture, like what's important to most people, like I think, you know, starting a farm, starting a restaurant, starting, you know, why is food important, like nutrition, all these things need to be held as, of, as, of, as important as something like, you know, being a lawyer or a doctor, which is also, you know, important as well, but um, I think we've kind of lost our way a little bit on what why those things are important. I'm sorry, what? Oh, there we go, sorry. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think uh, we just all have to kind of readjust and, and think about those things as, you know, food in my world is, is kind of a capitalistic thing. I look at how can I make money with it? How can I um, serve other people with it? How can other people grow within it? Um, but I think a lot of people don't realize, like, it takes so much more work for food gets to me uh, there's farms, there's fishermen, there's all these different things that have to happen. There's so much work out there that is food dependent. Um, so I think we just really need to focus on those important things and that in itself will grow into bigger things. Thank you both. We've talked a lot about healing, healing through our foods. We've talked a little bit about my visit to your restaurant when we walked in the door and we felt like we were home. We felt like there was a place for us on our long ride to DC. And that importance to be able to read a menu, and Joe, I have team members that go to your restaurant, and just to read the menu, there's healing in that. There's visibility for our people. Talk about what you create in your space, both of you. You create sacred space. How do you do that? How do you create home for those individuals that walk in your restaurant? Because food is a, I have a restaurant in Rhode Island, in Charlestown, Rhode Island. And What's it is, the name? It, Tell everyone the name. It's Fox Den, two, T-O-O, -O, meaning also because I bought my first restaurant in 2019 and worked on it so hard. It's a big restaurant and um, living museum, cultural center. It's such a big restaurant that I didn't get have time to finish it. 2020 came, pandemic shut down the country, so I shut down the world. So I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was at a ceremony in the Narragansett Territory in Rhode Island, Charlestown. And I ran across this little, I had to go to the gas station, I ran across this little restaurant. I said, I need to take a chance on this. I, there was a sign, nobody was renting restaurants, nobody was into buying restaurants at that time. So I said, I just 
took a chance. I called the landlord. The rent was reasonable. I'm in there like swimwear. So, <laughs> and, but when I went in, it was pretty, pretty trashed and had to work really hard to get it up and made, I wanted to make it like home, like my home, like an indigenous home and sell indigenous food because I wanted to educate people on not just my tribe, but all of our tribes. It repre my, rep my, my restaurant represents the whole East Coast and it represents how we grew up and how we support each other. I, I buy um, all my produce from an indigenous person and fishermen, my brothers are fishermen and you know, hunters and we have venison, we have quail, we have rabbit, we have all kinds of good stuff, turtle soup and you know, the, the, it's an unusual menu but we do have bacon and eggs. Yeah, and we have venison sausage that we serve. We have um, all that different kind of stuff. We have coloring books with um, indigenous pictures and, and you know different books that we like to share with people on um, indigenous lives. So we want to we want you to come in and be comfortable and and um, ask us questions. If I'm there, I come out and I enjoy who comes in and I thank them for coming in because I'm a very thankful person and I'm grateful for what I have. And Creator hasn't stopped. I agree. I think uh, one of the other big things is credit. Uh, how many people here, when they're at the grocery store, buy something because it says it's sustainable or it's organic or it's uh, artisan made or all these things? Uh, we're the originators of that. Um, and I think a lot of that marketing that all these companies have worked so hard to get your dollars, like we've been doing those practices for so many years. So a lot of it is just finding ways to get our credit back with that, that we have done these practices. We, uh, you know, you believe in buying local, you believe in buying from the farm down the street, um, indigenous or not, it's, it's that importance of community that really is the culture. And I think, uh, Unfortunately, the, the way that food has worked is it's always been a what's making money and what's not making money versus like what's better for this area. I mean, we're sitting in our Harbor, Maine with more fishing boats per capita than any place, you know, in Maine, essentially. Like uh, a lot of that seafood gets shipped all throughout the country because it's value. So when you think about that, like, all that fish that's fished here could feed everybody sitting here rather than shipping across the country. Um, so I think a lot of people don't think about that either as they think, well, I need to eat that avocado because it's, it's healthy. But it came from California. It didn't come from here. And there's plenty of things that you could eat here that are as healthy or better for you and didn't get shipped across the country. And I think that's the big um, thing that people are missing when they're talking about uh, you know, how their menu should be set up, how, you know, what should I order when I come to a restaurant, and it's kind of our job to direct those people. Yeah. I think about food conversations a lot. We have food conversations at the organization that I'm at, and people are always, <clears throat> excuse me, they're always generally happy. They smile a lot. It's a joyous meeting, usually. Food is the common denominator. Absolutely. So I think about a question, Sherry and Joseph, that we were pondering when we first talked, and it was, can we love our earth as much as we love our food? And that question is sitting with me again. And as I reviewed our conversation early this morning, that question was not in bold, but it's still in bold for me in my mind. So I think about that, and I think about how you guys connect to that responsibility in your work. And if only all chefs did that, I think we'd see a difference. And if all of we in this room collectively and outside could think about that a little bit more, we could see change. Absolutely. We're all responsible. Creator gave us this beautiful place to live in. He gave us 
the right to live, the right to love, the right to share, and the right to take care of our earth. And by doing that, each of us, our water is sick and it needs, it needs songs. I believe it needs songs, it needs prayer. And I believe it will heal with other stuff. But if you just do your part, I'm gonna do my part. I'm not gonna put fertilizer on my grass so it can be green. I'm not gonna put chlorine in my water or on, on you know, in my, in my laundry. There's other things that you can use. That chlorine kills grass, it kills the water. I mean, it, it really starts with the water, I believe. You know, keeping, keeping, if we just do our part, there's so much we can do. Yeah? Yeah, yeah I'd say, um, you know, we're sitting in what, is, what was once considered the, you know, the wealthiest place in the world, the United States of America, and yet the three biggest problems are water, food, and a roof over your head. It seems like those three things should have been solved uh, a long time ago, and I think prior to European contact, our, our people did solve that thing by our way of life. So any time that we can graze, uh, bring awareness to like our traditions and our culture and get back to that sooner, I think we're closer to fixing these problems. Honestly, you're picking your dandelions and calling them weeds and they're very important you know, resource for your diet. And the root, the flower, we, the, we have the flower at our restaurant. My mother makes dandelion wine. If you want a little treat, she does, and it's very, very good. <laughs> I'm gonna bring us back to history a little bit. We really can't talk about or really can't even address what we, how we can raise a visibility in the area of food if we're not talking about some of that history with commodity food programs, the taking of our land. And both of you have menu items that <laughs> celebrate, recognize both our traditional foods as well as the foods that were brought to us through these programs. Can you talk a little bit about your menus and how you've recognized both? Want to go first? Sure. Um, I don't want to be greedy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say a lot of the reason for, for doing both, um, you know, I'm sitting next to best chef in the Northeast. Um, food, our food has to get to a very high place for people to respect it. Um, I think with that, you do have to, you know, get in survival mode. You have to do your traditional ways that a lot of people respect, but you also have to do these other modern techniques that the masses respect. And if you don't find your way to mix those two things, um, you're just going to be that kind of old show. You're not going to be current. And I think staying current is extremely important for all of our, all of our culture, all of our craftsmanship, all of our um, just ways of thinking. If, if it's not kept to a place where the younger generation respects it, then they're not gonna take it on where we leave it off. Um, so I think with, within doing that, within food, it's, you know, it's very popular right now. Everybody wants to read about food, everybody wants to watch food. Uh, because it's so common, there's not a person in this room that hasn't consumed a meal. You know, you go out there and you watch somebody make a basket and it's, it's great, it's awesome, it's, but the reality is majority of us will never make a basket. And I think, uh, it's very important that food leads the way in this. Joe, when I think about your menu, you have very old recipes. Um, your three sisters recipe, if you can tell everybody about that. And then you have some more newer indigenous foods like the fry bread, like the taco. Can you talk about those two dishes? Yeah, so our three sisters succotash is essentially um, it's a dish that celebrates, you know, pre-European contact. So everything on that plate is something that would be found in the Americas 
long before any Spaniards or any Europeans showed up. Um, and I think it's, you know, most people have had succotash. It's come out of either a can or it's come out of a freezer bag. They hate it. They've convinced themselves that they hate lima beans. They've convinced themselves that squash is this mess. <laughs> Um, so what we've tried to do is, is make it a traditional way and cook it together um, because that's how it would have been harvested, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And with that, uh, people start to understand, like, why those flavors go together because it's, it's always been a common denominator that if it grows together, it goes together. Um, we as humans, before technology, before freezers, before canning, whatever was growing at a certain time, you did have to eat together because it would spoil. And that was survival, and that's the story of survival with that dish. Um, also, with the with the native tacos, like we, when we did make contact and we were first on the reservations, obviously we were given wheat flour, we were given lard, we were given other types of proteins that we not weren't necessarily used to, you know, pork, chicken, uh, beef, uh, not indigenous to the Americas. So we were forced to survive on that, and I think that's an important story because. Our generations certainly wouldn't have flourished without that survival. So we do both of those stories and both of those dishes to celebrate both. There are so many stories about your menu. I think that's one of the things we do best is tell stories. Sherry, tell us a story about your menu. Let me think. Hmm. I loved your clam chowder. So we're coastal people we're seasonal people, so we eat by the season. Um, my favorite season is springtime, when the fish come from the north, the herring. So herring uh, is one of my favorite, favorite foods, foods. We also use it for fishing, for uh, fertilizer in our garden. But I love it to catch the big striped bass. And that's my favorite food. Um, so I was taught at a ver very early age. My father, there were six of us. My sister's in the audience and she can testify. Um, I remember um, my dad taking us, teaching us, teaching us how to fish for striper and, and bluefish also. Um, they used the herring for bait. So he took me, he put me on a jetty. A jetty is, you know, um, rocks that go out to the water so when the tide comes in, you know. Um, he took me out there, he put the bait on my hook and reeled it out and said, here, when you feel something tugging, reel it in. I was probably seven or eight. So the fish got on and almost pulled me in. <laughs> and... I let the whole thing go. I let the whole pole go. And he told me, I'm never taking you fishing again. <laughs> but he did. He did. We always went, we went fishing. Fishing was the best in striped bass. We have on our menu seasonally. Um, and one thing about that fish, sometimes they hang along. They, they circulate as well. They're here in the, in the spring. And from spring till about October. Right now they're out to sea because the water's cold. They like colder water, so they follow. And then um, they're gone probably in December. Sometimes you might find some lingering, um, but I love it stuffed. And we make a, a quahog stuffing that we put it in there, or we'll sear it real quick and just serve it with some nice fresh vegetables. In the springtime, I like to serve it with fiddleheads. Everyone's going to be going down there in the springtime. <laughs> Talk to us. We have a lot of people in the room. Talk to the audience about what they can do. What can people do at home, do in their day-to-day, -to, -day to support the work that you two are doing? We have to support restaurants. Go ahead, don't be afraid to try an indigenous restaurant. Um, I'll tell you, they're coming. They're coming, they're, they're out west. A lot of them are out west. Thank you, they're, they're in California. 
Um, I have meet and met so many chefs all across this country and they're all amazing. We're all different, but we all have the, you know, food is our common denomination, like I said. And I think to support, I think that you should just come and, and, and listen to us and support us in any way that you can. I certainly second that. Um, I'd also say there's a lot of work of uh, just doing the research. When you, know, when you eat a dish and you think that it's French or Italian or Asian or Mexican, or um, do your research and figure out where some of those ingredients came from. Figure out, um, are there any Italians in the room? Oh, okay, that's strange. <laughs> uh, I guess I won't make anybody mad, but you think about like tomato sauce. Like we had tomatoes for 12,000 years before Italians did. We had fire, we had clay pots. You can't tell me that we didn't create tomato sauce long before the Italians. Um, you know, chili. I mean, everybody thinks that chili is this Tex-Mex, you know, cowboy dish, but we had beans, tomatoes, all types of meat. We had everything that goes into chili long before any cowboy ever showed up here. Um, so you kind of think about everything that's on your plate day to day and, you know, who are you giving that credit to? Who are you um, thinking about? Like, uh, and if you wanted to experience a lot of this cooking yourself, I mean, anybody who's ever cooked over a fire, you're cooking in our technique and our way or, or any early prehistoric human's way. Uh, so I just kind of think context and like realizing what you're doing when you're consuming food is, is a big part of it. Yeah. When you think about food sovereignty, what do you think about? Well, I think about my childhood. Being sent to my grandmother's to roll her hair, to hang out her clothes, but then to watch her cook, watch her teach me to cook. Listening to her stories about when she was a child, bringing that knowledge back and sharing that knowledge with your children when you get older. But when I, was, when I was a young girl, I mean, I grew up in the 60s, so it was a little different f for Joe. Joe's a young buck. So he's, he's got a lot to, um, he's got a long, beautiful life ahead of him as a chef. Um, I didn't open a restaurant until I was 61. It's 60, it's, this is my fourth summer owning my first restaurant. Well, I owned one in 99, but that don't count because it's not open yet. So I'm, I bought this restaurant to raise money for that. And I bought it and thinking that I'm going to do all the food that I grew up with seasonally. And I, I do. I do most, most of that. And then I do a lot of my favorites. I do like lobster mac and cheese because that's one of my favorite on the special. Um, I, I, I love doing like rabbit, roasted rabbit with, with uh, root vegetables. And I love, I love doing duck, duck hash. We have that for breakfast sometimes. Um, and we all do lot, lots of fish during this time of the year and lots of vegetables. We have a lot of vegans now and vegetarians and I love when they come in because a lot of um, vegans and vegetarians don't have um, lots of places to go, honestly, and that's, you know, they don't have a lot of choices at a lot of different restaurants. So, like our succotash, I have succotash at my restaurant, corn, squash, and beans, our three sisters. Um, I add onions and kale to that. And just, I just spice it with salt, pepper, and garlic, lots of garlic. I love garlic, and it's so good for you. It's medicinal. Um, but I do that, and then if you want to add some meat into that, I'll do, throw a piece of smoked fish. Um, we do smoked salmon, we do smoked mussels, and all of these great foods, but it's just, it's fun. It's totally fun. I, I'm living my best life. Mm. Uh -huh. Yeah, you deserve a hundred of those. So Joe, talk to us about food sovereignty. What does that, 
What does that mean to you? What comes to mind? Um, I'd say there's a, there's a whole lot to it. Um, you know, fishing rights, hunting rights, those are a big deal, obviously. Uh, you know, what you're able to grow on your own land. Uh, obviously, that's why we have a lot of people fighting for uh, tribal lands and, and rights and, and all that stuff, which is extremely important. Um, but I think when I think of food sovereignty, I also think of, like, the way we value food. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting in a place where, you know, I charge money for food. And, and the more that I have to pay for it, the more that you're going to have to pay for it. Or the more work that I put into it, the more you're going to have to pay for it. Right. Um, and, you know, so I'm hypocritical in that a lot of times because that's, that's the way we survive with it. Um, but I think we need to find a way that access to food is a little more even keel and a little bit more, um, and I think that just comes from more people actually cooking themselves. I mean, restaurants are profitable in what they are because there's a lot of people that aren't willing to cook food themselves. The reason why I have certain customers that come multiple days a week is because they're just not willing to cook themselves. So I think if we all start pitching in, then that becomes a little more of an even playing field and a little bit more of um, understanding. Like the, the community I cook in, um, it's a very small town. So you do have the other customers that are like once every month. And these people do cook on a regular basis. And they're my harshest critics because they know what they're doing. Um, some of these bigger city 